I am really enjoying this, this time as, as a Vineyard family, this time that, that uh, you know, part of it that we kicked off in, on uh, last Wednesday with Lent and going through this, experiencing God, but also being a part of this journey through looking at glory, and the glory is a theme in the Gospel of John. Today we're going to pass a threshold, and, and we're moving out of the public demonstrations of glory into private instruction between Jesus and his disciples. The first 12 chapters of John, they've been an announcement of the glory of God that's been visible to the, to the known world, an invitation for all of creation to step into the presence and experience the reality of God. But we are going to witness a change here. And one of the things I love about this change in this next section of the good news found to be true is that what we see in, in this more intimate teaching, Jesus to the twelve, is he really defines for the twelve what he expects the church to look like. And so what we step into today is this presentation of what Jesus expects his church to look like, this body of the Messiah, the activity and the self-expression of God into creation. We get to see his expectations for what we look like. Now, this private training is meant to prepare them for the unfolding plan of God. It's also meant to prepare us for the unfolding plan of God. It's a training meant to impart what it means to live in the kingdom of God, to experience the kingdom that was breaking in from this, this time that we would expect it or that we would experience as Advent all the way through what is about to happen at the end of this week that Jesus is, is experiencing in, uh, in, in historical times. It's a training that, that's going to reveal not only how prepared they were to experience God, but it was going to prepare them to experience God in a more real way. They're going to understand the implications of responding to the weighty felt presence of God. They're going to be able to grasp the meaning of glory. And they're going to see it both as a reflection of everything that Jesus had walked them through over the previous years, but also the things that were about to happen during the week. And this, uh, this is where we pick back up in the Gospel of John, chapter 13, if you join me in chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his, his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He loved his disciples during his ministry on earth and how he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prepared Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you don't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and my head as well, Lord, not just my feet. And Jesus replied, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who, who would betray him. That is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put on his robe again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right because that's what I am. But, and since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I've given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth, slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. Now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. This is a picture 
of what the church ought to look like. What we see in in reading this is that the hour of glory is near. We've been defining the weighty felt presence is our definition for, this is our definition for glory, right? That weighty felt presence of God. But here we have another view of glory, glory as a result of an event. This is the thing that gives weight to the presence of God. What Jesus is about to do is the thing that gives weight to the weighty felt presence of God. It's also the thing that that testifies to why we can trust him, why we would submit to him, why we would be willing to actually do the things that he's telling us to do. All of this is based on trust and the fact that he did what he did not only adds weight to his presence, but it gives us the, the, the reason that we can trust him. He's about to be glorified. If you think about the difference of how maybe I would respond to about to being glorified and how Jesus did, William Barclay points out that Jesus knows what's coming. He knows that this is the moment of ultimate glory. This is the moment of ultimate acclaim. For many of us, or I can just claim it and say for me, this would be a reason that I could embrace some pride. Maybe bask in the glory that's coming. Enjoy the limelight. Press into self-importance. Press into that, that feeding of affirmation that would come. But Jesus, the Christ, does something different. As this group gathers for dinner, there is an awkward cultural violation that's happening that causes some discomfort. Now, some of you don't know this about me, but I am a student and practitioner of proper etiquette. (laughs) (laughs) See, I'm frustrated a little bit by the, uh, the, you know, y'all laugh when I'm not joking, and you don't laugh when I am joking. I'm wondering, uh, where did we get these wires crossed? I am... Um, I am a student and practitioner of proper etiquette, and as such, because of my my awareness of etiquette, I'm able to see this coming. I I see the discomfort coming. Etiquette is also so much more higher of a force in the East than it is in the West. This is not something that that, uh, etiquette to an American is a lot different than etiquette would be in in the Middle East or in in some other Eastern countries. areas of the world. Etiquette would demand, especially at this time, that guests that go to a dinner like this, upon their arrival at their at the house, they've got some grime and and what we'll call foot funk, and they'll have that washed off by a, a household slave. But this this was a pretty lowly task so low and humiliating that it was not permissible to make a Jewish slave perform the task. It had to be carried out by a non-Jewish slave because to touch the feet is, this is, um, it's just, it's gross and, and debasing and you would not ever insult or debase somebody to that level unless they were not a Jew. Etiquette played a role, but also Jewish law plays a role because both etiquette and law would be violated if dinner was served before this task was carried out. You can't eat with foot funk. But the problem is, there's no slaves present. Jewish or otherwise, there's no slaves present at the dinner. There's no one low enough to accomplish the task. Now imagine the 12 standing around. They're looking at their foot funk. They're looking at each other's foot funk. They're realizing that there's nobody low enough to deal with all this foot funk. They're wondering now, what, what's worse? What, what's worse here? Do we start the meal unclean and have everyone jointly humiliated by eating with grimy feet? 
or one of us humiliating ourselves to wash the feet for everyone else? That doesn't sound like something I'm wanting to do. And so the 12 are in this weird etiquette dance of like, I don't know what's worse, but I also know I don't want to touch your feet. This moment is not comfortable. It shows that, that th- those closest to Jesus, closest to the revelations of glory. Now, we remember over the years that they've walked with Jesus, there's nothing that they haven't seen. They still struggle to understand what is going on. To differing degrees, each of these followers, even, you know, we step outside of the 12, including the group, one step removed from the 12. You think about, uh, about disciples that, that aren't included in the 12, like Mary and Martha and Lazarus. They, they are, are being broken out of a system that tells them that working for right relationship with God to earn a place with God is to be good enough at following the rules and taking part in the rituals. This is the paradigm that, that Jesus is breaking, but this is still the paradigm that they are attached to. And so this is really creating an issue. The process and culture that they know produces religious observance, and it's motivated mostly out of fear. Even when we look at it from a conformity standpoint, the reason that they're looking to conform is out of fear. Fear and conformity as a product of pressure for other people to do the right thing, say the right thing, go to the right place. The journey they've been on is a, is a journey of submission, though. Not a submission of conduct, but a submission of life. And it's clear that they need another lesson. So Jesus does the unthinkable, the countercultural, even the scandalous. The self-expression of the living God steps into humiliating service in order to provide that lesson. He rises, takes off his clothing, girds himself with a towel, and performs the task that's even too low for a Jewish slave. How can we see this event in the narrative of glory that we've been following since January? How do we see this through that common thread of the weighty felt presence of God? We see in this passage the weighty felt presence applied to those that have chosen to follow Jesus, and that application demonstrates how the presence of God will be felt by creation in the age of the church. I want to say that again, because this has to matter to us. This application demonstrates how the presence of God will be felt by creation in the age of the church. Also, we're in the age of the church. replicating humiliating service is how creation will experience the weighty felt presence of God. Replicating humiliating service. I'm thinking now even more about how there's another way that that we express glory Raising up a leader above everyone else. Making that person's presence the weighty felt presence, right? Also, making another religious code for people to follow as an expression of of experiencing God. And all of the things that 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 demonstrates is that we're not responding to the glory of God. We're, we're We're responding to the glory of man, and it's a subversion of what we're seeing here. We're to replicate humiliating service. But we're going to talk about that more in a second because we have to take a quick turn because Peter is petering. And I love Peter because he peters. I don't know what I would do without Peter petering. He provides us another angle to view this application of glory as more evidence of good news found to be true. 
And it moves beyond an information-only realm. It speaks to submission. In other words, we can't just have this good news found to be true. Stop at the information-only position. It has to move into application. I am so thankful for Peter because he's acting like I would. Peter's not stupid. Peter is... He takes a lot of flack for the stuff that he did, but thank God that he did it because I would do those things. And he is teaching me as he responds the way that I would respond. What's playing out here is imagery that points towards the cross, points towards the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus dying for us, dying in order to create a path for us to have reconciliation with God. Jesus is continuing to unfold the plan of God, but Peter is not yet submitted to the plan and he just doesn't know it. He's not submitted to the plan and he, also, he doesn't get the plan. He doesn't understand it yet. It isn't how he would do things. It doesn't align with what he thinks that he knows. The thought of the Messiah taking the low position of foot washer is bad enough, but to die as sacrifice rather than lead a political or military victory over non-believers, over the oppressors, this episode, it, it points to the cross and Peter objects. He objects to the foot washing, but by extension, Peter objects to the idea of Jesus lowering himself to the place of sacrifice. Peter objects. What he's about to find out is that objecting to the service of Jesus is objecting to the sacrifice of Jesus. Objecting to, objecting to serving like Jesus is also a rejection of the glory of God. Objecting to Jesus serving me is objecting to the sacrifice that Jesus made for me. By extension, then, for me to, accept, to object serving like Jesus is a rejection of the glory of God, both in my life and in the lives of the people that I will come into contact with. Jesus provides a correction to Peter that speaks to me as well. When we're bathed all over, we don't need another full body wash. This, this is linked to Jesus asserting that unless he washes us, we have no part of him. These two parts of the story are, are connected. What exactly does it mean to be washed, and how is this a manifestation of the weighty felt presence of God? Jesus is saying that unless he washes my sins away by his atoning death, I have no relationship with him. There is no other way. The only way for me to have relationship with the living God is for him to serve me by washing my sins. Now, a few weeks ago, I talked about an opting in to the kingdom. And I know that this, this idea of opting in doesn't sit well culturally. But this is what I mean by opting in. When we opt in, what we see is that Jesus will take my place on the cross if I let him. It, this, this adds a bit of gravity to the scene that's happening outside of the dinner, the scene that we saw in, in chapter 12, the scene that will ultimately lead to the arrest, the torture, and the crucifixion of Jesus. Men who loved the praise of other men more than the praise of God. People that were locked in competitive survival and, and making up of their own kingdom, building up their own kingdom. People unable to say, 
your will be done over my will be done. People that would choose religion and ritual over a life-changing relationship, all of this is not just an active choice for self. It is an active opting out of what Jesus offers. An opted-in person, a person that allows Jesus to be sacrifice, a person that allows the king of the world to step into humiliating service for them. An opted-in person is clean. But as Jesus further explains to Peter, uh, one of the things that we see is that a clean person is going to pick up some road grime on the journey of life. Amen? Anybody here have a little bit of road grime? I got road grime. I'm using road grime now. Hopefully you've, you've felt that transition from foot funk. We're now talking about road grime. We know that this is true, and it also pushes back against a lie or a misunderstanding of what a church is or what happens when we step into relationship with Jesus. We know it's true because when we opt in, we are not a perfected work. When we opt in, we are not perfected. We are a perfecting work. We are in process. Now, I like to see this through the lens of, of progressive revelation as well as sanctification, the process of becoming more Christ-like. Progressive re uh, revelation is a, is a really simple concept. It means that I know more about God today than I did yesterday. It means that I know more about God today than I did 10 years ago. It means that I know more about God today than before I knew God. It, knows that I, it means that I'm, I'm becoming more aware of knowing the things that I don't know, but also knowing there are things that I don't know. Applying that to life, even though I was opted in a decade ago, I know God better today than I did then. I look back at things that I did 10 years ago, and oh my goodness, some pretty embarrassing trash right there. <laughs> but I was opted in. I just didn't know what I know today. And so I did things that I would never do again. I said things that I would never say again. I have context now that I didn't have then. I treated people in ways that I would never treat people again. I was opted in, but I would act differently today than I did 10 years ago because my relationship with God has grown in depth and I get it more. Peter didn't get it here, but when we follow the journey of his life, we see at the end that boy got it. A piece of this, though, is I also know that I will get it more in the years that I have left. Which means, a piece of this is that the way I will treat you today is not the way that I will treat you in 10 years. And so you got to deal with me. You have to deal with me in the way that I treat you right now. You have to deal with me because I've got all of this road grime that, that Jesus is offering to wash off. And it may, I am clean, I'm opted in, but that doesn't mean I'm going to treat you well because I am a perfecting work, not a perfected work. I don't want to hurt people. I know that I will. I don't want to do things that are, that are bad. 
I'm working that stuff out. But all of this shows that we opt in, and in the perfecting work of becoming more like Jesus, we're going to pick up some road grime, and there's a way to deal with it. The way to deal with it also is a reflection of how we ought to treat each other in church, how we ought to behave together as a family, what this looks like as the, the plan of God continues to unfold. I am so thankful for understanding progressive revelation because it means that I'm actually not as terrible as I thought that I was. I'm just working out of that towards something else. If that's true for me, then it also is true for you. And it also has to be, oh man, when it becomes true for you, oh, I got to treat you different. Oh man, this is, what, this is where it gets hard for me. I love, I love when like, I can tell you, hey, just go with, t- take it easy on me. I'm, I'm, I'm a perfecting work. But now we turn it around. Now we turn it around and, and we say that what you did a decade ago is not what you would do today. What you did a decade ago is not a reflection of who you are today. It's not a reflection of where you're going to be tomorrow. It's not a reflection of where you're going to be next year or next decade. Think about how much of the grime of life we pick up based on the way we relate to each other and how there's an inverse relationship between grime and grace. The less grace we have for each other, the more grime we pick up. The more grime we have, the more difficult it is to treat each other with grace. That gives us another view of what submission looks like. But also, grime comes from another area. Not just as we perfect this work, but also grime comes in the form of sin being worked out in our life. As we're being perfected, we're having sin worked out of our life. And what I I really am not teaching here is a hyper-grace message. This sin is... is, um, We can't overstate what sin does to a life. But we cannot allow that to over or to underemphasize grace. But we have to be aware that grime comes in the form of sin being worked out in our life. We can apply progressive revelation to this as well. I have been, I look back over like the last 10, 15 years of my life, and I had no idea the depths of my pride. I also kept thinking that I would hit bedrock in digging out my pride, and that, man, that hole just keeps going down. Like, you just want the shovel to hit something solid, dang it! But I understand now what motivates me better than I did when I was a younger man. And so I can understand the root of my sin in a way that allows me to actually have that grime washed off, at least washed off to a different, to, to a, a, a deeper level. I see that, that in this process that self-righteousness is slowly bleeding out, but it isn't dead yet. I see my sin in a different light because also in this progressive revelation I see the sin in a different light because there's more light on my sin. And what I see now is what I do to other people. When opted in 10 years ago I saw what other people did to me. My point in all of that is simply that opting in is the beginning of a journey. It is not the destination. Because we are on the road, we are going to get road grime. Now, this is not an excuse to sin. 
We can't say, well, I'm on the road, so like whatever. I can, you know, I can take like a, a Rasputin view of things. Like if I don't sin, then Jesus can't be Jesus, and so I need to sin just to give Jesus something to do. He's got plenty to do. <laughs> this is the beginning of the journey. It's not the destination. We're on the road. We're going to get road grime. This is a point of, an, of awareness, so I understand who I am. Also, so I can understand where I'm going. And also, even more than that, understand the work that Jesus is doing in me so I can be more like him. And he just gave us a really good example of what it is to be like him. Now, just as the custom would be to wash before a party, walking to the party would, would mean traveling through the muck of the streets, and so foot washing was called for. Towards the end of this chapter, Jesus gives us a little bit more context that I think is important for us here. What happens between this teaching, this foot washing and the teaching and then this, this section that we're about to, to look at is, is actually quite a lot. The biggest piece here is that Judas is now not a part of the twelve. Judas is gone. He's left to carry out his betrayal. Jesus is aware of this, and he continues to teach. John 13, verse 31 as soon as Judas left the room, Jesus said, the time has come for the Son of Man to enter his glory, and God will be glorified because of him. And since God receives glory because of the Son, he will give his own glory to the Son, and he will do so at once. Dear children, I will be with you only a little longer. And as I told the Jewish leaders, you will search for me, but you can't come where I'm going. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Our love for one another will prove to the world that we are the body of the Messiah, the activity of the living God, that we are the church. The glory that Jesus is about to enter into was the sacrificial act that would give even more weight to his felt presence. More weight to the felt presence of God. What it means for God to be glorified because of this and receive glory because of the Son simply means that the character of God is going to be displayed and it's going to be felt. This act will display and cause those that, that, that have it displayed to, to feel the presence of God. This answers a, a lingering question about the opt-in that we've, we've talked about before, but we have to deal with again. Is it safe to trust God? We know that it's not safe to trust people. We've experienced that. Why would it be safe to trust God? And we see the brokenness that it serves as the foundation of asking that question. I can't trust people. I can't trust God. And now, with all of this stuff going on, I have to trust people as the display of God. How is that even possible? That answer resonates through this passage. The answer also, it comes by way of the, the action that Jesus is taking on our behalf. He's going to be beaten, slandered, abused, ridiculed, humiliated, tortured, and executed in the most barbaric way that the empire of Rome had yet to de devise. And they were really good at thinking up things that were pretty gross. Nailed to a cross to slowly suffocate as his lungs filled with blood, his strength giving out so he can't raise himself up any longer to breathe. 
choosing to take that action for me, I would argue makes him trustworthy. But there's more. Jesus is using his glory to replicate glory. The teaching that began with foot washing just gives us context for this new commandment, a commandment that, if followed, pushes back against the narrative that people can't be trusted, and by extension, the lie that God can't be trusted. Jesus demonstrates not only that we need regular foot washings, but we're to humble ourselves to be the foot washer. We, together as the church, are called to love one another enough to allow our vineyard family to make a mess on the floor and then clean it up after them. Grace to their grime. Grace to my grime. This disarms the self-righteous keyboard warriors, the stone throwers, the ones that attempt to turn following Jesus into an attack on, on anyone that doesn't fit their mold. This is following Jesus. My grace for your grime. We demonstrated our opting in this by girding ourselves with a towel, and then we washed the feet of our church family. We submit also to a foot washing from our church family. The ultimate support comes from the reality. And let me say it this way if you don't feel support today, if you feel isolated, alone, if you feel unseen, untethered, the ultimate support comes from the reality that there is nothing you can do that would separate you from the love of God, which means there's nothing that you can do, there's nothing that you have done that would separate a follower of Jesus from the love of their church family. Nothing can be done to separate a person from their family. Because we have this example of grace over grime. This is what it is to be the church. This is what we are called to do as followers of Christ. This is how the world will know that we are those things. Because when you have grime on your feet, you walk into the midst of your family and submit to being washed. But also, we take our place girded with a towel, washing the feet. We submit to the washing and we submit to the humiliation. This is one of the coolest things that I've I've found lately in preparing for a sermon, what I'm about to tell you. This is from a writer, A.E. Witham. And in this, he's a a, a mystic. Uh, He's a follower of Jesus. He is uh, a a really phenomenal writer. He he writes this um, about visiting a museum in the city of his dreams. He goes into this museum in the city of his dreams and he's examining the exhibits. He says, I see a widow's mite and a feather of a little bird. I saw some swaddling clothes in a manger. manger. I saw a hammer, three nails, and a few thorns. I saw a sponge that had once been dipped in vinegar. I saw a small piece of silver. Whilst I was turning over the small drinking cup, which for some reason had a very honorable place, I whispered to the attendant, Have you got a towel and a basin among your collection? No, he said, not here. They are in constant use. Vineyard, as we step closer 
to his glorification. We're being ushered into the revelation that glory will be seen and felt by us, but also through us. If that glory is the glory of God rather than the glory of self, it will be demonstrated by the humble washing of the foot funk of our friends. Amen?